All right. I want to talk about fathers, just basically what fathers bring and bless. I'm going to stay on the positive side. I don't know. I've encouraged you several times to realize that a lot of these young people that come up here didn't really have fathers, a large percentage of them. Uh, probably a, a, at least over half, more than half, didn't have a father growing up, literally. Gone, jail, drugs, drunk, angry, violent. We've got some young people here who've reached adult stage in life and did not have these blessings in their life. And so they've been, they've been sent to us. So why do you think they've been sent to us? So my wife, Rhonda, she immediately identified with Willie. And I'm not sure what her position there is, but whatever Willie does when she's there, she's right there to take the pictures or hand the papers. She's like Girl Friday. And I don't really have much of a role there except to, stand, to come and be a point of stability to show up and for this, these kids to see me and say, somebody's there. Somebody's there for me. If I need help, this guy's here for me. It doesn't require, <laughs> I mean, I could be a potato uh, you could carve my face on a big potato or a pumpkin or something. I mean, I'd probably look more like the pumpkin thing, you know, Halloween. But, uh, but listen, fathers, they do a lot. God is our father. He's a father. That's how he's described. And is he a father in the same sense that we are? No, he's a... He's an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, eternal spirit described as Father. So, I don't know what your father was like. My dad was very stable. He was the rock. He was the one that was always there. He was available. And let's talk about fathers. First of all, fathers, healthy fathers, growing fathers, spiritual fathers provide unconditional love. This is an enduring and long-term long stability in the life of their children. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, see how great a love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God literally should be called to be children of God, and that, and that is what we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. So people aren't going to, outsiders are not going to be able to look at your life and understand your relationship with your Father. So let me ask you a question. Do you actually have a personal relationship? Or do you just have a theoretical, <laughs> principle-based understanding. I mean, do you actually talk to him? Do you actually listen to him through the Holy Spirit? A discussion, a talk, ask questions. One of the greatest things that helped my prayer life with God for living life was to start asking questions. Lord, how does this work? What do you want here? What's this about? Started getting answers. And next week I'm going charismatic, but anyway, uh, I'm just teasing. Uh, agape love, listen, what is agape love? And this is important to understand what this is, and I think I've got a grip on it. Agape love is a common human love. See, it's a human love. The word agape, agapao, was used of normal, normal daily life. It, it wasn't a created, Christian-created word. It was a word that Christians borrowed and used to describe 
a mindset, a way of thinking. It's a common human love that is fixated on and committed to the benefit of whatever the object of love is. And you're determined to benefit and never cause harm. You benefit and never cause harm. Luke eleven forty three. 43, woe to you Pharisees. I want you to see that this is just a human. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love, you agapao, you agape, the front seats in the synagogue and the respectful greetings in the marketplace. Now imagine this. These guys were committed to gaining the praise of men. That's what that's about. The chief seats, the, the greetings, the, oh, so good to see you, sir. This respect, they were committed to that. John 12, 42, it says, Many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess or acknowledge that. They didn't publicly say that they believed in him. Why? Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. If they said, we believe this is the Messiah, they'd have been put out. Why? Listen, for they love, they were committed to the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Okay? The word agapao, agape, means to be committed to something. Now, let me give you an example. When I was a young a teenager, my older brother Mickey, Michael, have a friend named Michael and some relatives named Michael, but he bought this 68 Camaro. I mean, holy mackerel. That thing was like a bulldog. It sat low to the ground and it was mean. He started it up, the whole house would rumble. He loved that car. He doted on that car. He had these white wall tires. <laughs> Once a week, he would get a little bucket of Clorox and go out with a little brush, and he would brush those white walls so that they were gleaming. He loved his car. He was committed to it. If he heard a sound, uh-oh, that's agape. That's agapao. He's committed to it, fixated on it. So that's how God is with you. He is fixated on you. He is committed to you. He is, he is aware of the tiniest change, need, problem, failure. He's aware. He's fixated on you. He loves you. He is committed to you. So I think that's what the word means. Agape love in the believer who is informed and enlightened and, and empowered by the Spirit produces a commitment to spiritually edify others, abandoning the selfish requirement of receiving something in return. So you say, I'm going to church. I'm going to listen and learn, and I'm also going to edify someone else. Not going just to socialize, just to talk about football, and nothing wrong with any of that. But the goal of agape love is to edify. How can I encourage you in your spiritual life? I mean, what is my gift? Mercy. I look for people that seem to need compassion. Exhortation. I look for somebody that's in the ditch. So you want to edify. That's what that idea is. And so the Holy Spirit should be producing that in your life, this desire to benefit and edify others. This is what fathers do. Fathers think about their children. How can I edify them? How can I encourage them? How can I help them get on up on their own? The goal is to get your children stable and on their own because they can't live off you forever. They have to live off the Lord. One of the challenges is to stop letting them live off you and look to you for their approval and force them to look to the Lord, to put them on their own. That's difficult because that feels wonderful when they look to you. 
Well, listen, they have to grow up. If it's a girl, if they have to start looking to a husband and to the Lord. If it's a boy, he has to start looking to the Lord. So, John 15, 12. This is my command that you love one another just as I have loved you. So, when you come, other believers in your life, do you think that about them? Ring, ring, ring. Oh, it's so-and-so. Wonder how I can encourage them, edify them, build them up, <laughs> confront them, admonish them. So, a father's human instinct is to love his children. When he's growing in the Lord, he strives to commit himself to their benefit. He sacrifices his own. He puts their needs above his own. He teaches them, giving them guidance correcting their rebelliousness and assuring them of his love. He teaches them about forgiveness. He forgives his forgiveness of their failures and shortcomings and sins, teaches them to practice that with others and themselves. So he provides a steadiness and emotional stability that engenders confidence in their future. Uh, I was talking with one of my children this morning. They were thanking me for, for being a steady love in their life. And I just thought, what if I hadn't been that? Because I've not been all completely stable. Every step of the way, I've had my ups and downs. I've had health issues, three back surgeries, kind of up and down with some of it. So I wasn't there all the time because of those types of things. So... A father is committed to love his wife. Listen, the way you treat your wife teaches your children how a wife should be treated. So when a daughter becomes a wife, she looks for a guy that will treat her that way. That can be good or bad. Oh, listen, that's, that is the core relationship that teaches everything to husband and wife. You know how children learn to respect their father? Listen to their father, take his advice, be respectful of his advice from mother. If you're a father and your wife doesn't give you respect, visibly, openly give you respect, she's teaching the children not to do that. They're going to grow up, and, and if they're a girl, they're going to disrespect their husband, pass it on down. If they're a man, a boy, watching that happen, they may marry a domineering woman or someone who is disrespectful, or they're going to, or they'll go the other way and be angry and marry someone they can dominate. This, this relationship, being a father, this <laughs> marital relationship is critical for training children. Not what you say. Listen, you can talk to your blue in the face till children. They observe what you do. Amen. So that's why it's important for you to grow. That's why it's important for you to spend your days and nights learning and listening and focused on the Word of God and taking it in and putting it out in your life and practicing this, practicing, practicing, failing, 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 and then getting it right. It's critical if you want to pass down a positive spiritual influence to your children. Fathers provide. Logistics, this might be the simplest part of it, but it's so misunderstood. Jesus said, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, drink, what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles, unbelievers, eagerly seek. This is your earthly, human earthly agenda. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Just as God the Father foresees and provides for the believer's needs, so an earthly father is given the task of working to provide for his family. 1 Timothy 5.8, if anyone, any man does not provide for his own, and that word provide means to think ahead, to plan ahead to be aware of what's coming. 
and especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than, worse than an unbeliever in the, in the way he's acting. When, when God was handing out curses after the fall, he cursed the earth where Adam was tasked with cultivating it and producing food for his family. So Adam inherited this curse on the earth. The task of cultivating the ground was addressed primarily to the man, while the woman was cursed with the pain related to childbirth we call curse of the womb. But listen, that doesn't mean that women can't work and provide. Listen, the, the whole idea of women not working, men working and women not working, that's a silly idea. Women have always worked. They've always worked. They work just, their work isn't all, always that visible. My grandparents, back to the old days. He went out in the morning, cultivated, cultivated. They grew, big, had three acres, big garden. That's what he did. Grandmother, she worked in the house. She cut it up, she cleaned it, she canned it, she prepared it. It was a, it was a joint task effort. Nobody said, well, grandmother don't work. That's silly, right? Silly. What, what the world's done to women these days is tell them, tell them if they don't work outside the home, have some kind of visible business career, that they're worthless. Listen, the world is coming down hard. We were protected for a long time by divine establishment principles and a strong church. But all that has gone by the wayside. And so children today, they need a lot of protecting. They need a lot of guidance. I don't know if they're going to listen. You know, they don't listen to you for the long time, and then they go out and they get their nose bloodied trying to make their own way, and they look back and go, wow, you really, you were right about some of this. Of course, my answer is, yeah, I was right about all of it. <laughs> anyway. While the husband and father is given the, and listen, listen to this, this is real important. The husband and father is given the task of working the cursed ground. God is the one who guarantees that he will provide primarily through the father's efforts. Luke 12, 30, for all these things, the nations of the world, the, the unbelievers eagerly seek, but your father knows that you need these things. Seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you. We spend all of our life, especially men, some women, pursuing security through money when it's something that's already promised and guaranteed. Now, should you not work? I'm not saying that. I'm saying take the load off. Work to... Glorify the Lord. Use your job as your ministry. The, the, your living is guaranteed. You say, well, the Lord may not give me as much as I want. Well, that's another thing. That's a whole other topic. The love of money. We used to say, money is the root of all evil. Well, you got to have money. No, the love, the love of money. The hunger for money, the belief that money will somehow make everything all right, is a root of all kinds of evil. So, thirdly, the father is a teacher, provides training and guidance. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. God the Father, knowing our need to understand his plan and that we might choose to believe his promises and follow his plan, sent the Spirit to be our indwelling constant companion to teach us. He's a teacher. He's a guide. He's a mentor. I was having struggles, so I read this book that said, if you're struggling with, the, with your inner self, Start listening to what you're saying to yourself, your inner dialogue. When I did that, I saw, I said, I think, okay. I was amazed at what I was 
what I discovered, how I was beating myself up and guilting myself and calling myself names and you're so worthless because you're not living this perfect life and blah, blah, blah. It's just silliness. One of the things I learned was that the Holy Spirit was in there. He was talking to me. There was this stupid voice over here. But there was this other voice that kept telling me truth, giving me grace, giving me forgiveness, kindness, graciousness. Who's that? Sure wasn't me. Holy Spirit. I began to become aware, practicing the presence, we call it. So, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Fathers and mothers are responsible to raise their children by training them in the Lord and admonishing them to follow the Lord in their life. Ephesians 6, 4. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. That This is improper discipline. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Training and teaching includes correction to re curb rebellion. But you got to be smart about how you deal with your kids. Now, some of you have smaller kids. I had one kid I never should have spanked. One I spanked once. One I spanked every single day that did nothing. Might as well have been spanking the wall. The wall, the wall would have responded better. And then one, you just had to look at. That was it. Didn't need a lot of spanking. Now, I'm not advocating or, or not about spanking. That's kind of a crazy thing this day and time, but like a lot of other things. And in our home, we had boys and we had girls. Okay? Boys and girls. You follow me? I don't want to get us kicked off YouTube. Do <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I'm not kidding. Now you say, well, why do you care? Well, because this goes out. People listen to it. Lots of people listen to it. And you want them to be able to get it. So you have to speak in code now. If you don't want to, if you don't want to get canceled out, you have to speak in code. So, as children enter adulthood, wise fathers learn to let go of their training role and enter a consulting, mentoring, and guidance role in their children's life. You stop initiating so much guidance, so much wisdom, so much, <clears throat> if it were me, I know, Dad, but it's not you. So, when the spirit of John 16, 13, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will disclose it to you. Fourthly, the Father teaches boundaries. This is something that's not understood well, and it's very, very important. Uh, I'm talking to a couple that are claim to be able to read each other's minds. Now, they don't out and out say that, but she says, the other day when you said such and such, I know that you meant this. He's like, I didn't, that's not what I meant. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> of course it is. And he does the same. That's a boundary that says this person gets to decide for themselves what they think, what they believe, think, say, and do. And they get to decide for themselves what they mean. This is what I mean. And you don't get to look into their soul and go, no, I don't think so. Now, as psychologically oriented person as I am, I definitely have a struggle with that because I always know what y'all are thinking. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to read right through and see all of your secrets and 
You know I'm just teasing. So, boundaries, they're simple things like, oh, see, obedience is about boundaries. Don't eat the fruit of that tree. Boundary. All right? The, the ideas about sin is crossing a boundary. Biggest mistake, one of the biggest mistakes I've done I've, in my life, I'm just now learning about, is thinking, and this is, what, this is what you think when you live by rules under law. You think that, the, that as long as I don't sin, what I'm doing is okay. As long as I don't sin. You can be pursuing something in your life that is completely not even part of God's will and still not sin. The word hamartia, sin, means to miss the target. It means to aim at the wrong thing. What are you aiming at in your life? What is it you believe and you're envisioning? If only I could have this, I'd have it going on. I would feel so good. What are you aiming at? See, this is a boundary. There's boundaries in your life, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a pathway that's the will of God for your life. It includes work. It includes money. It includes love. It includes all the earthly things, but it's not ever about those things. It's not ever about those things. The boundary is it's about the Lord. What did Ron say earlier? For Christ's sake. For his sake, what does that mean? For his benefit. The divine agenda is for God's benefit. You get blessed by it, but here's what I want you to see. The boundary that you're teaching your children, if you're pursuing only the earthly, if your life is about the earthly, and I know it is about the earthly, but it's really about the divine. If your goals are just earthly, and you may hey, you say, well, I'm a good worker, you know, I'm not drinking, I'm not doing, I'm, I'm, I get up and I do my job, and I'm a good man, and I do what I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to make a living for my family, but if that's, what, that's, that's all you're about, then you're, then you're off target. You're into sin. You're into hamartia. You're missing the target. You're not aiming at the right thing. Hamartia is more than just the three categories of mental, verbal, over sin. It's aiming at the wrong thing in your life, having the wrong goals and purpose and beliefs about what this is all about. So you teach your kids boundaries. You teach them to respect someone else's freedom and, you know, wait, touch them. I mean, they touch each other. Don't touch me. He's touching me. You ever had kids? That's a boundary. Don't touch your sister. Right? How That works too, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. Gracie, many of you know Gracie, when she was little, she's had the best laugh. I mean, she had the best laugh that history ever produced. And I used to love to tickle her. Oh, I would get, I would tickle her and not, uh, I should have recorded her laugh for my dying, for my deathbed. <laughs> and one day, she's about eight or nine, she said, Dad, I really don't like that. Would you stop tickling me? <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I can, you know, because it was, but I had to respect that boundary. To this day, if I walk up to her from the side, I don't know if maybe you saw this picture the other day, or this is a little video of someone, a really beautiful actress being hugged and having to grab somebody's hands and get them off. That was me. 
and children. So I have to respect that. See, there's a boundary. You teach your kids to respect boundaries. So finally, listen, as long as the father is able, he's home base. Home base. You remember home base? Take, playing tag or what is it? What is it? Hide and seek. If you could get back to home base, you were safe. Home base is your parents, as long as they're there. And you provide home base, a place of stability, a place of supply, a place of encouragement, of edification, of forgiveness, of kindness and compassion. Your home base. And listen, there's some of you in here that are that have been that for years, and you're that now. And I salute you for that. You're really a home base if you're growing spiritually. Listen, life is not about earthly possessions, and it's not about that, and we know that, but we forget that. And so we provide our children with sustenance and provision and logistics, and, and we love them and we give them advice if they call. But listen, seeing you growing spiritually making God important first, focusing. I'm in Romans 8, studying the word phreneo. He says, if your mind is focused on the flesh, his favorite word for the sin nature and the sin system, he said, you're controlled by the flesh because you're focused on it. You're focused and you're imagining and thinking about and talking to yourself about things of the flesh. If you're in the spirit, he said, if you're walking in the spirit, it's because you're focused on the things of the spirit. Let your children see you and your grandchildren focused on the things of the Lord. Focused on the things of the Lord. Well, Father, I thank you so much for you being our father. And you, listen, you wanting to be father to everyone. You being able and have the supply have the love. There's no end to it. And I thank you for giving that to us through your son, Jesus Christ, and revealing it to us through the Holy Spirit. We love you, Father. We thank you. Happy Father's Day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.